We're live. What's up, guys? Welcome to the BitLift Podcast. I'm here with Brian today. What's up? What's up, buddy? What's up, man? That's a beautiful looking chart you have pulled up. Oh, yeah. It's my favorite chart of all time. That's how we do it. We always have these epic conversations on like different types of analyzing the markets. A lot of times we're talking fundamental. Sometimes we're talking narratives. Last time we hung out, we were busting out our phones. We were like at a meetup. There was 50 people around us, but the two of us were like at the edge of a table, zooming around on our phones on TradingView, analyzing some technical analysis, analyzing the charts. And I thought, man, this would be so much better on a big screen. And it would be so much better if people could see what we're up to and what we're talking about. It was such a great conversation. So I figured I'd just have you on here today and we'd zoom around a little bit, talk about our kind of philosophy of charting uh, and and how we use it, why we use it, and then maybe dive into a few charts that we enjoy looking at. Beautiful, man. Let's do it. Yeah. So I think, I mean, I think the most important first place to start, I think people probably know what technical analysis means. It's sort of this art of doodling on the charts, as I, as I like to say. Um, but obviously, there's other ways of analyzing the markets, right? Like, fun, you can analyze the fundamentals of a crypto. That might be like how the price and the supply work, or maybe it's like a revenue. Or um, So there, there's a, there, that's kind of more like fundamentally how we feel about the project and how it's going. And then there's the, the technical side, which is, is much more kind of price related as the way I see it. How do you how do you think about technical analysis and how does it kind of fit into how you analyze a project? You know, so um, interestingly, the fundamentals you mentioned, also mm -hmm. the market sentiment, the psychology and the behavioral psychology, I think actually all gets captured in the chart. Um, mm -hmm. So the chart is this beautiful. Uh, it's historical, right? It's it's backwards looking, um, and, but it's giving us a a beautiful uh, illustrative view of what's happened in the past and then what the setup looks like today. Um, and, and what's particularly useful about that is that certain patterns, certain types of, of, uh, charting give us the ability to make very specific price predictions. Um, so I, if, if I was to distill down the, the, the biggest use of technical analysis, I think it's mm -hmm. that it allows us to forecast the future to have a good sense for uh, what where the market's been and where we think it might be going. And that's super useful for trading, right? I mean, both yeah. in terms of a risk management um, perspective, you know, where do you set a stop? When do you get long? Uh, and also, when do you profit take, right? Which is, is something we should all be thinking about as we as we potentially kick off a new bull market here. Exactly. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. You never know exactly what's going to happen, but you have to have a plan. Like, what's your plan, man? And it's got to base it on something. Unfortunately, all we have to base it on is the historical pricing and the historical movements that have happened in the past. The past isn't guaranteed to repeat, but we always say that it rhymes, right? So like what are those rhymes telling us and where are we going to where where do we want plan to maybe pull the trigger at? Where would we plan to maybe buy uh what and like when a price reaches a certain zone, like how does that zone now change our plan moving forward? I th it sounds like we use it in very similar ways. We've talked about how we use this stuff in very similar ways. Uh, and, and we do. Um, so like, and when we're talking technical analysis, we're talking charts. In my mind, I just, that I'm using TradingView. TradingView.com is like my go-to. I think for a long time, there was like a few others that sort of were maybe in the mix. But in the last, I don't know, man, like five years plus, I think TradingView is the go-to. It's like embedded in most exchanges now. Um, that's what I use for all my charting. Do you use that and or anything else? That's yeah, it's become all I use over time. Yeah, yeah. it's in, it's incredibly user friendly, very easy to draw on. They've got just about every type of pattern you could you could dream of drawing. And then on top of it, yeah. they've got these um, indicators. It's like a crowdsource indicator model, right? Where yep. you can you can build an indicator and make it publicly available. You can also publish your charts, and people can kind of upvote them or downvote them. So yeah, super useful tool. It's like a social media plus charting. I love it. Yeah, I do too. And I mean, I think it has a million features that I've never even had a second to figure out yet. I would love to someday do like a mega deep dive on it, but just the basics uh, is kind of all I've ever needed. So uh, I think we'll start there. Let's start. Let's start with basics, right? I think it's a bit intimidating for a lot of people. They see all of these buttons and features and things. And I, like I said, I use maybe like 5% of the features. So uh, when I set up my chart, it's very basic. Um, 
I use candle indicators, which shows like the open and close as well as the high and low for the day. Um, and then I only put like, uh, I put a 50 day and a 200 day moving average and volume. And those are the only like indicators, so to speak, that I have kind of defaulted on my charts. Uh, do you have any other like any other defaults that you like to p pop up? No, I, I actually use it almost in exactly the same way. I will I will sometimes use a panel for RSI, um, the relative hmm. strength index, which is a momentum indicator that is essentially looking. It's an indicator looking at the price performance of a specific asset relative to itself, actually. And it gives you it can, it can give you some good readings on. Um, you know, consistent bull or bear market trend, overbought, underbought. Um, so I sometimes use that. But I, and I would also say like the best way to figure out trading view is just to, you know, it's totally free to get a free account, sign up, yeah. click around, mess around. Um, if you start using it, you'll learn it in no time. I agree. And I mean, once you draw a line on there and then you come back a month later and the line is still there, it all clicks. It's like, <laughs> oh, I see. It's I see how this works. Okay, cool. So we're using that similarly. And I just, I also wanted to touch on a logarithmic view. I've always, just like since the beginning of investing in crypto, I've always used a logarithmic view, but I know it doesn't always apply to like every market. Um, when do you, when do you use it and when do you not use it? So yeah, I'm actually really glad you brought that up. It's, um, it is like charting 101 to me, but it has some complexity um, for people to think about. So um, like looking at your, Chart. Yeah, I can toggle it over here. Yep, yep, perfect. So um, essentially, when you talk about linear charts versus logarithmic, um, you're talking about the interval that defines the spacing on the y-axis. and mm -hmm. Yeah, it, the scale, the price to... scale, so to speak, yeah? Exactly, exactly, yeah. And so a linear chart would have um, the same, you know, dollar spacing, let's say, yep. between... So here's linear right here. You can see that the spacing on here it looks like... Four hundred or four thousand dollars between each between each price print on there. Exactly. Now, if you toggle back to logarithmic, now here uh, on a log chart, this the the hash marks on the y-axis uh, are actually percentages, um, mm -hmm. which which is, in my opinion, that's the correct way to look at every chart. I actually don't look at any chart uh, on a on a linear basis. I look at everything. On a logarithmic basis, because if you think about it, like the price movement, go back to when Bitcoin was, you know, a hundred bucks. Um, yeah, the, <laughs> it's the, <laughs> flat. It shows nothing. Right, right. And the price movement from a hundred to two hundred was massive. I mean, that was a doubling, right? But yeah, if you look at today's price, you know, BTC at thirty six thousand. If it goes to thirty six thousand one hundred, that's that is almost insignificant in percentage terms um, versus mm -hmm. a doubling. You know, back when it was only a hundred bucks. So, so it gives you a really um, it gives you, it's kind of like that relative um, look at price performance through time. What you want to see is what percentage gains is the asset showing you over time rather than mm -hmm. a fixed dollar amount. And that's, and that's especially true for something like Bitcoin or Ether, any cryptocurrency that's had massive price gains where those early days uh, along the y-axis just aren't relevant anymore. Got it. Yeah. The way I, I had thought about it before, and I kind of like your view better, but I'd thought about it before like something that is going through like an exponential growth chapter. Like the only way to really see that is in a logarithmic view. Um, and then I thought maybe like, I don't know, some dividend paying stock, maybe like Coca-Cola or something. It's just so flat that like, why would you view it that way? So I would always look at that without logarithmic turned on. But I guess even on even a chart like Coke, it with logarithmic on, it's still as like, you, you, you can still see a bit more of the context of what's going on in this view, I would say. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, yeah, okay. I use log for everything. I like thinking in exponential terms. That's why I'm in this asset class. And it's funny, like if you ever see anyone trying to, um, you know, push push a FUD uh, bubble chart in the cryptocurrency space, mm. they always use a linear chart because it, right. it always looks funny. Because <laughs> it's so extreme. Yeah, I mean, look at this Bitcoin chart. It's the freaking wildest thing ever. And it's so weird. You Like over here, 2013, which doesn't look like part of the cycle at all it looks like nothing but you know if you zoom all the way over and then zoom all the way in it starts to look just like the cycle we just went through you know and then you can you can navigate back to the last cycle and it's the same this log view is really it's the only way to view this and especially it does look a hell of a lot prettier that's for sure but we're not necessarily going for pretty we're going for helpful and i think helpful logarithmic is much more helpful all right so that's that's definitely uh how how we're talking there um 
And then how about time frame zooming around? You know, I see a lot of people get caught up in like the hourly charts and they're like, they're not even like day trading or like high frequency trading or any of that, but they're, but they always look in like the minute view, you know, cause it kind of defaults to that sometimes. Um, I bookmark a trading view and I bookmark the monthly view because it forces me to have to start with the monthly view. And sometimes I need a little reminder to zoom out, right? We always needed a little reminder to zoom out. So I don't know. Do you have like a default starting point when you're analyzing something? I'm, I'm, yeah, it's, you're, it's funny. You're hitting on all the rookie charting mistakes. Um, yeah. Getting, yeah. I mean, anytime I'm looking at like an hourly chart, I, there's, there's one, there's always one good piece of information in that, which is that my position size is way too big. <laughs> yeah you're looking at it that granularly because you're freaking out a little bit <laughs> yeah but i'm i'm exactly like you i mean the the longer term time horizon charts are always the best place to start and you can zoom in from there i actually yep. love i love you know when we get into technical patterns i love patterns that break out across multiple time horizons so sometimes uh -huh. that's something i'll look for where you might have a daily breakout that the target from that move um, is a breakout on a weekly or monthly chart. And that can really signal a huge setup for you. But I love like, yeah, just like you've got, I think, is that a monthly view you've got pulled up there? Yep, this is monthly. Yeah, yeah, that's like, to me, zoom out, start there. Um, you can see the dominant trend. You can see the significance of that 200 month moving average blue line. I think that you've got uh, drawn in there. I don't know if that's 200 or 50. Um, that's 50. 50. Right? Yeah. yeah, yep. I don't yeah, think I there's it. 200 months uh, in existence yet. I think we're getting there. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, I always start with the zoomed out view and then zoom in from there. Um, so you start with the longer term picture, the secular theme, the longer term theme. Again, remember going back to that, the fundamentals are represented in the chart. Like if I mm -hmm. go back to the history, um, like on this beautiful bit stamp chart you've got pulled up, um, yep. you can clearly see the dominant long term decade plus long trend up and to the right. And then if I yeah. zoom in, you know, on, on a daily chart just to the last, you know, kind of 12, 18, 24 months, that's going to give me some information about what the market's doing today. But I always want to be mindful of that long term secular trend as kind of the dominant trend. So that's why I love just like you do. I love starting with that that monthly chart. Like for years and years of, of my early charting, the only thing I ever did was draw very basic support and resistance lines um, by support. I'm talking about the floor, right? This is like for whatever reason, the price tends to respect this 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 floor line that you can kind of easily draw by connecting either the, the bottoms across years or the bottoms across the last kind of like secular uh, sec or cycle that we've been through. Um, and then the resistance would be like the ceiling. Um, you just kind of connect some tops and you can, you'll notice that the price tends to just respect these lines. Um, let's talk about, uh, and we talk about fit. We've, you and I have talked about fit a little bit before here. Let me pull up uh, on this chart here. I've got one simple, simple, very long-term line that I drew that goes like across all the segments um, on Bitcoin. This is this line actually. It just all it does is it connects the bottom of the last two cycles. Um, so in uh, 2015, this was like the bottom after the third after the 2013 top. Um, it connects this bottom here. Yeah, I can click here. You can see the white circles. It just connects those two bottoms. This to me is like this to me is an important like floor line. And I was actually really surprised that this cycle, we broke below it and we're sort of like, and when I'm talking fit, this idea that like the price respects your line, you don't know that it's going to necessarily respect your line in the future. You can always like fit the line to be perfect, like historically, but then you don't know, is, are, is it going to continue to respect the line that you drew? And there's nothing better than coming back like two years after you drew a line and just noticing that it's still respecting that line that you drew. Um, so talk to me a little bit about fit. I, I feel like it's a little controversial. Like if you just make the line fit, then of course it's doing like what you think it's going to do. But, you know, you, it also you want it to fit. Like if it's not fitting, then what then what's the point of it in the first place? So let's talk fit a little bit. So, yeah, so I don't use horizontal lines um, for entry and exit or technical analysis. But I but I do think, you know, just like if you're um, let's say you're just think about basic statistics like stats 101 um where you might have a, a dot plot um and you're trying to draw you're trying to show the trend right is there correlation is there not correlation and you might just take a straight line that represents the the median intersection of the x and y axis and draw it through that mm -hmm. dot plot and it gives you a general view of is it correlated is it not correlated um and it's useful in that sense 
for sure. I think with something like Bitcoin, like this is a particularly interesting chart. I mean, you could have connected, let's say, the bear market low um, in, I don't know if that was 2011 or 2012. It was kind of right as it was getting a, a, a trading point. Yep. yep. You could have connected that to the low in uh, 2014, right? And then, and then you would have said that by 2019, 2018, 2019, we're trading below it, right? And now you have yep. to kind of, now you have to kind of um, flatten that line to connect the, the last two bear markets as you had done as, as your starting point. So to me, yep. it's like, especially on a logarithmic basis, over time, you know, Bitcoin, it, it just, it's not possible for it to continue to produce, you know, the same types of returns that it's produced historically, because at some point it would just eclipse the total amount of dollars in the entire system if it grew at that <laughs> rate after, after a very short period of time. So it's natural that the kind of the, the uptrend is going to lose its lose its steepness. It's going to flatten out over time. Mm -hmm. And I think and I think that's that's why you're seeing it trade below that trend line you drew. But at the same time, it's a great, useful exercise, especially as you suggested, where you draw it, you might come back to the chart, you know, um, a few years later and just see where it's at. And it gives you some perspective. And what about this idea that like, uh, all of the technical analysis, everyone that's using technical analysis out there is drawing the same lines and plotting and scheming the fu their future trades based on, you know, we, we, I think I have this unique insight based on this line that I drew, but really every person looking at this chart is drawing the exact same line. If you and I both pull up our charts, like we're going to have very similar lines. Do you think, is is that playing a role in like the future of the price? Are we like, kind of is this like a self-fulfilling prophecy kind of a thing going on or are we just like respecting the lines i don't know yeah it's a good question um a little meta uh, of course we yeah can't, we can't know for sure i think yeah i think look it's it's like we go i go back to the beginning of our conversation the technicals capture the full picture in my mind so the fundamentals mm -hmm. are in there somewhere the sentiment is in there somewhere the chart itself the technicals are obviously clearly well represented um and of course, the traders are trading that. We're all looking at it, right? And so yeah. you can have instances where positioning gets off sides with a pattern um, simply because everybody's looking at the same thing. They get positioned for a move and then the move doesn't happen, right? And then they have to take their risk down, right? We've seen that before. So that's why, I mean, if you're mm -hmm. trading on a short time horizon, you want to use tight stops um, where you can or at least protect your downside. But I think there's also something to be said for trading the traders, right? I mean, there and, and as we get into some charts here, I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, but if you think that um, traders are going to buy a break out of a certain threshold, you can actually time your entry and, and front run them. And then you can mm -hmm. take you some risk off the table before that move even gets started. So you can kind of, you know, to go one layer deeper, um, you can try to anticipate the the technical traders um, and get in, yeah. front of their, get in front of their moves as well. So there's just, yeah, it's, it's complex, a lot of ways to a lot of different ways to think about it. It's the ultimate game. We're all trying to play each other in this thing. Um, okay, so, and one last thing I wanted to hit on here, because I know it's something that I brought up like a couple weeks ago with you, and we disagreed on a little bit, which is that I always connect, when I'm drawing support and resistance lines, I always connect the highs and lows as opposed to the opens and closes. So an open and close on a monthly basis would be like uh, January 1 and January 30th. That would be like the open and closing price. But I would connect the highest price in January and the lowest price in, 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 on the other side of my line. And that's actually, I think, where we started talking about fit. It was just like, well, I mean, which one just seems like it fits better? Maybe we just use that. Uh, I use highs and lows. It sounds like you use open and close. Uh, does it matter? Or how do you think about it? So I use um, classical charting principles. You talked about, it's funny, you talked about horizontal support and resistance. And I have probably 2,000 hours of technical study. I across a variety of different um, technical uh, programs and, and different different ways of looking at TA. Um, yep. And and ultimately, like I have defaulted all the way back to like the developed in the early 20th century, like basic, you know, geometric patterns, which is called classical charting. And and the most the most um, dependable lines out of those uh, out of that print out of that uh, technical philosophy are horizontal support and resistance. So it's, fun, it's just interesting to me going back to your last comment that you came onto that very easily. I wasted a bunch of time before I, I realized that that's kind of the best, um, mm -hmm. the best indicator out there. But when it when it comes to classical charting, the the principle around fit is the default is closing is actually closing price. Now, where mm -hmm. you're in my debate on this um, crossed over is that well, where is the closing price? 
for crypto. It trades 24-7, right? Right, um, exactly. But it does have a closing price that everyone agrees to. And going back to that trading the traders, we know people are looking at closing price bars as of a certain time. And so I will default to that. However, I will always override based on best fit. So, And that's what classical charting um, suggests is that sometimes you're connecting the ultimate highs and the ultimate uh, lows. Sometimes you're connecting the closing points. You just look for what is the chart suggesting to you, and then you draw the line based on you know the market's representation of supply and demand at a specific price point. So you'll sometimes see me connect you know the wicks, and you'll sometimes see me connect the closing bars. Um, and yep. I think that's the right way to think about it. I mean, if you were drawing patterns on charts, let's say with multiple time horizons. Like the mm. closing bar for a weekly and a daily is going to look different. And maybe that's why you you default to ultimate high and low. But there could be a trade that happens on a wick, like way out of whack, way out of line with the market. And you wouldn't want to use that to draw your chart. So you got to kind of use a little bit of discretion. It's a little bit more of an art than a science on that piece. Yeah. Yeah. While you were saying that, I was even just noticing like my chart is set to UTC time. I wonder what what the, what time is your chart set to? Do you have it set to New York time? I would assume that would kind of be more like a global standard in some way. Or maybe it's not. Well, I don't know. Yeah, mine's UTC as well, and I and I think that's a, the agreed upon like global okay. standard for crypto closing prices. All right. Well, there we go. I'm going to leave it on that then, even <laughs> though even though I connect Wix. <laughs> so. All right. Good. Okay. So that uh, that covers uh, some of the basics here. Um, I think something that that I you'll see on my chart I've got the havings on here I've also got like the the highs from each cycle on here this is just like my default of of bitcoin chart whenever I start a bitcoin chart is I just like it gives me perspective on like where we are in the overall cyclical uh, life lifespan of bitcoin so I always kind of start there but I've got another fun one here that I just want to throw up while I've got it here to show you this is these lines are the market the bitcoin market caps the 100 the bitcoin 100 billion dollar market cap and the $1 trillion market cap. And what I find interesting about it is first, you look in this last cycle, how, how much we respected this $1 trillion number. Like to me, it, it, this, what this says is like the entire, like the narrative of this cycle was, is Bitcoin a trillion dollar asset or not? It is like what we were deciding on over the last two years. And it looks like we landed on, it's not. Like it wants to be, but it's just not. And that's what the price says. Um, but what's interesting about the the cycle before was it almost seemed like we were trying to decide is Bitcoin a, a hundred billion dollar asset or not. And then, you know, we got this blow off top, which we we've talked about a million times how in the 2018 cycle, like we got this we got this crazy blow off top. But in this last 2021 cycle, we didn't have it. And it almost feels like that's the difference this is something I'm going to keep an eye on into the coming into this next cycle. It's like the blow off top, it's going to happen from like a trillion to 10 trillion or maybe 10 trillion to 100 trillion or I don't know how many trillions exist in the world at this point. But I just find it interesting how there is there's some fit with this market cap number. And I want to show you that. Super interesting. Yeah, I, I, I love those lines. That's a neat perspective. To me, that makes so much more sense than... You had everyone just dialed in on BTC going to 100K last cycle. Um, yep. And that's not really that meaningful. I mean, yeah, sure, there's round number, you know, magnet and resistance, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, 100K times 19 million, that's the, that's the, the mm -hmm. significant number. Um, I like thinking about it in terms of market cap. I mean, it's not a perfect fit looking at your no. chart, but it is interesting to, to see those lines. And um, yeah, it's a super, it's a super uh, neat way of looking at it. I really like that. So yeah, I, I always start with Bitcoin. Um, it, in my mind, like it's the it's the market, like it's the it's almost like the the index of the crypto market in a lot of ways for me. There are, however, indexes of the crypto market, and I wanted to ask you about that. Is is like, do you ever look at Bitcoin dominance, for example? It's another. It's it's one of these um, charts that we can pull up that shows, you know, what percentage of the entire crypto market does Bitcoin represent. Uh, do you ever pull that guy up and take a look? A hundred percent. Yeah, actually, that's uh -huh. one of my that's one of my favorite charts and indicators right now. It's a super interesting. There's a lot of information in that chart. I think we could dive into it um, if you'd like. But yeah, I I do look at that. I actually didn't know that ETH dominance existed. I see that on your on your crypto yeah. watch list there. That's neat. Let's see. ETH dominance is at eighteen percent. Let's go weekly. Yeah, ton of information in these charts from my perspective. That's really interesting. I mean, man, look at. Look at how ETH is just consolidating for years here. 
in the se- in the eighteen to twenty percent range. It's 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 pinned. That is super interesting. Um, how about total market cap? Total crypto market cap? Yeah, I look at that as well. Um, and that to me is a very it's a very bullish looking chart, right? Because you had you've got this kind of clear bottoming pattern that's happened in the in the bear market over the last you know 18 24 months a breakout and now it's kind of holding above that breakout level there's a lot of wood to chop up here um just thinking about all the price history from that 2020 2021 bull market um Mm -hmm. but to me that's a that look that's a very clear chart that's suggesting that this space is not as the bears would say it's not dying it's not going away that there's there's something um, here that still has people's attention. There's still money flowing into the space. Um, and so the, yeah, that's a great one. It's kind of like start with your monthly chart, right? Start with that broad perspective. Take a look at the whole market. Yep. I agree. And I mean, I I'd say like, if you flip between them, like the Bitcoin chart and the total crypto chart, like they look the same, they look, or they look very similar rather. Cause I mean, this Bitcoin dominance is, is 53% at some, at some points along this. I mean, obviously you see it pinned here at 98%. That was pre Ethereum days, right? Um, then we had the Ethereum ICO, which <laughs> like that got an extra 5%. But then we really got ICO mania, which was all the alts coming. Um, peaked at, I don't know, how do you, what's the reverse of a peak? It troughed at 35%. That means at one point, Bitcoin was only 35% of the market. That happened so in one year from, we went, we went from 95% to 35%. And then that's a that is a volatile swing, man. That shows the power of that ICO uh, cycle that we went through, right? Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. And actually, if while we're on it, um, yeah, one of the most interesting things about the crypto market to me right now is the resilience of Bitcoin as a dominant yeah. asset in the space. I mean, you've mentioned right now it's fifty three percent of the market, and what's particularly interesting, and here's where technicals can be interesting in kind of giving you some information that doesn't feel correct to me, but actually is, Mm -hmm. um, which is like if you go back to that low in 2018, after the ICO bull market and into the bear market, um, you've got Bitcoin representing 35% of the total market. And just making sure people understand what this is, this is Bitcoin divided by the market cap of all cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin. Um, Uh and so it's, it's 35% of the total market value. Then you get a bear phase, right? Where it climbs its way back to probably about 75%, um, by 2020, 2021. Um, and then in the next bull market, which was, what did we have? We had stable coins, we had DeFi, we had NFTs, we had so much stuff, right? And then look at the, and then look at Bitcoin's low in that bull market. It actually comes down only to 40%. So from a technical lens, it makes a higher low than it did in early 2018. And think about all the stuff, all the money that's flowed into this space. Stable coins really didn't exist in a meaningful way back in 2018. And yet Bitcoin today at 53% represents more of the market than it did going back, you know, five, six years ago. So even though it feels like, Bitcoin's not the big thing, um, you know, in some days, right? And people want to chase alts and, and, and you know, DeFi and whatever the next, you know, shiny thing is. Um, Bitcoin has been this just con- continues to be this really resilient asset. And I think this chart does a nice job of just, you know, showing uh, in one clean view how significant Bitcoin continues to be with respect to the entire value of the cryptocurrency space. Interesting. Yeah. And just to put a put a button on that. When Bitcoin kind of dominance sort of crashed, so to speak, to thirty five percent um in the in the first in the first during the ICO cycle, and then when it crashed this last cycle, it only crashed to forty instead of thirty five. And you think that that five percent difference that's important in your mind? Yeah, just like exactly, just like if you were looking at like an ascending pattern, right? I mean, one of the basic tenets of technical analysis is higher highs um mm-hmm. or higher lows right so higher highs is just a momentum driven trend where um you know you keep making new all-time highs right like the monthly chart of bitcoin kind of demonstrates that every cycle we get a new high so that's yeah. a dominant trend um but lower highs is also a a really um interesting um, piece of information where it tells you that over time and in this case from 2018 to 2023 this asset has actually become more significant for the space mm-hmm. and not less significant Interesting. And, and talking classic patterns, I wanted to fire this up real quick. This is like, if you Google like basic charting patterns, like this is this is what you get. 
Uh, and some of them are pretty basic, like an ascent, like a, a a triangle or 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 a, a down channel. And some of them you've probably heard of, like head and shoulders or double tops. Um, do you study these? Do these pl- are these like is this like in your subconscious while you're sort of like looking at a chart? Do you think they're all a bunch of bullshit? Like, what do you think about these kind of really gen- simplif- oversimplified patterns? Yeah, no, this is actually what I think works best in crypto. Um, yeah. I like distilling down to just the most simple indicators. Um, and frankly, these have been consistently reliable. Um, if you go back to classical charting patterns, Richard Schaubacher wrote a book in the early 1900s um, called Technical Analysis of Stock Market Trends. That was one of the first books on technical analysis that I read. Um McGee wrote kind of a follow-up to that a decade or two later that um, is also a, a fantastic read. And um, he, in this book, he describes exactly these patterns. And, it's, and, and, and to my point earlier about the technicals kind of capturing the full picture, he also goes, I mean, these books are 500 to 1,000 pages each, so they're pretty in-depth. <laughs> um, yeah. If anyone wants to read them, they're out there. I think they're, they're Creative Commons now, so they're free. You can just Google PDFs. Um, mm-hmm. But he, he goes through the explanation of um, what the behavioral psychology is that's creating these patterns, actually. So it really helps you. And if you think about crypto, like the fundamentals aren't, I mean, there's some fundamentals, but the valuation and the fundamentals aren't as clearly connected as they might be in like public equity land, right? So you really got to look closely at sentiment and, you know, what's everybody's mood? Are we greedy? Are we fearful? Are we bullish? Are we bearish, right? And so if you can have a technical um, picture that captures that sentiment, it's a really useful tool. So I actually think these are, this is the correct way to think about TA for the crypto market. These are the most useful, reliable patterns historically. And, and, and so far, they've, they've continued um, to, to, to function in that way. Yeah, I agree. These are the things that I just sort of notice. And a lot of times I don't even really know like the name of it, like a pennant or something like that. Like you can just you can catch the vibe that like in that particular pattern, like that's like a breakout. Right. And a breakout is when this price just you get good, like strong volume um, above one of your like resistance lines. And boom, that's that's the that's what you're looking for in almost every scenario. Um, and yeah, they're they're basic. But I like to think of them somewhat in my subconscious, like. I'm not looking for a particular pattern to emerge or something, but you just, you know it when you see it and who cares what the name of it is, right? It's, it's, and it is kind of that simple in a lot of ways, but they're not all, not all technical analysis can be simple. I wanted to pull this up just because I heard about it so much in the last cycle is this Wyckoff uh, accumulation and distribution thing. And I'm, th- I, I didn't, I didn't uh, let you know I was even pulling this up, but I, I'm curious if you stumbled on this, if you've studied it at all. Or if you, and if you think there's anything to it, um, I am familiar with it, but I haven't. I don't have any deep study on it. But if you have, um, I'm super curious. Now that you've pulled it up, I'd love to hear about it. I went down some rabbit holes on it. Um, what people were saying was that if there's whales in a market, and uh, man, th- this this particular image doesn't really give you enough detail on what exactly is going on. So this is the accumulation method, and if there's a whale in a market that wants to accumulate, like let's talk percentages of the Bitcoin market, then how do they do it in a way to maximize their average price? And, you know, you hear about like whales, like manipulating markets and whatnot. It's like if there was really like a whale big enough to manipulate the entire Bitcoin market, apparently the Wyckoff uh, accumulation method is the best way for them to do it. Um, And so the reverse is also true. If a whale was looking to exit a market, how might they manipulate a market in such a way in order to get the best exit price um, over the course of a cycle, so to speak? Um, that's the way I understand it. There's like multiple phases to this where they like they long and they short, but and then they kind of are able to average in and sort of like convince the market that there's this fake momentum going on so that they can kind of sell sell into it. Um, it's like a a big boy strategy that I uh, I would never need to really know how to uh, accomplish myself, but is it playing a role in the in these markets where everyone knows that crypto markets, the Bitcoin market in particular, is like the hot new space and that we all know the banks are coming, the institutions are coming? Are they actually doing this? That was kind of the, the question that kept popping up last cycle. Hmm, super interesting. Yeah. I mean, it, so the classical charting patterns um, give you actually good representation of, of oftentimes the same thing. Um, hmm. 
where if you do have a horizontal area of support and resistance, um, if it's support, that tells you that a whale um, or, a, or a combination of whales may be buying at that level. I mean, they're supporting the market at that level, right? And then yep. if you've got resistance, that means you, you may have a whale um, at a horizontal threshold that is uh, profit-taking every time the market comes up to a certain uh, price point. And you want to you keep a, a, a clear eye on how price is behaving around those horizontal levels. And then that, yeah, that Wyclef analysis seems to go even deeper into how someone might actually execute on that strategy. I, I, yeah. I hadn't studied that, but um, I'll, take a, I'll take a closer look at it. That's really interesting. Yeah, it seems cool. When you were just talking about like whale supporting a, 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 a particular price level, it just reminded me of the Doge chart that it just seems like it's so flat and so pinned above five cents that like no one could possibly get it below five cents. I don't know who or what is supporting it here, but it just feels that way when I look at it. It's it's so flat. It's like freakishly flat. But it's also it's also a it's a confusing chart because it made the same pattern. Yeah. It made us the same pattern in the last bear market, right? It yeah, did. it's almost exact. And and that is a descending triangle actually, where you can see it's a it's a mm -hmm. it's got a horizontal. Yep, it's got a horizontal boundary at the base, and then it's making lower highs. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So. You know that's typically a bearish pattern, um, but it already broke out once from that pattern um, into the last bull market. So um, who knows? Yeah, the the Doge chart has um, is 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 just confounds me, frankly. Yeah, um, it's a strange but, one. It's a weird one. <laughs> Everything about Doge is strange, though, right? Yeah. I mean, it's sort of its thing. Cool. All right. So, so that was good. That was kind of like really high level kind of charting stuff. I'd love to. I know you put a couple of charts together. Let's flip over to yours and uh, see if we can't get some other charts going up on the screen here. Cool. Okay. So this is a look at BTC um, going back to really the chart starts at um, the last in the last bull market at the, at the ultimate top of the last bull market. So that's yep. November 2021. BTC made a high around 69K. Um, yep. And the first not around. Like, Hold on, not around. Sixty nine k and zero pennies. <laughs> poor, it's so weird. The poor person who bought that top wick. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, hopefully, you're still holding on if you're out there. <laughs> so, what I did the first, the first, the first line that I would say, and I, I know I mentioned I don't put a whole lot of weight into horizontal lines, um, mm -hmm. but I thought it was particularly interesting if we connect the top of the bull market to this could you know if you go back to march of 22 this it, you could you could interpret this as a as a bear market trap where you trap mm -hmm. people into thinking that the bull market's going to resume um but then it fails and if you if you just connect those two points um you you can draw this orange line which which to me represented kind of the downtrend line of the bear market so i was watching yeah. that you know starting back in in um kind of between march and summer of 22 and what you can see is, um, you know, BTC really started. It, it sh you can see it if you just ignore all the lines on my chart. What's happening is it's in this clear downtrend channel, um, and then all of a sudden, you know, starting in kind of June of twenty two, it starts actually moving sideways. So that's mm -hmm. the first thing that I observe when I look at this chart is that it's in a downtrend, and then it starts moving sideways. And and along that sideways move, it actually forms a bottoming pattern. I'll come back to. Um, but what's particularly interesting is that when it breaks above this downtrend line in um, January of 23, um, it has a beautiful back test here. Um, I, did, I never redrew this line. This was the original downtrend line I drew. And it back yeah. tested perfectly to it in March of 23 and formed the right shoulder, going back to those classical patterns, which was kind of the final um, build of that bottoming pattern that, date, that dated back you know, uh, 12 plus months. Um, and if I, I have got the 200 day moving average toggled off here, but if I turn it on, you can also see that that back channel grabbed right at the 200 day moving average as well. So it was oh, a really yeah. interesting spot. Then you see, as you would want to see a huge thrust. Um, and it's at this point in March of 23 was kind of challenging what's considered to be the neckline of that head and shoulders pattern. So a head and shoulders, um, can be a topping pattern. It can also be a bottoming pattern. Um, and it can also mm -hmm. be a continuation pattern. So it's really tricky Maybe we'll talk about a few, but um, here, basically, what what the market is showing you with a with a head and shoulders is this red line here is a key point of resistance. So we broke down on it in June of twenty two, then we retested yeah. it one. So this is the first breakdown one. Retested it two. Retested it three, and now we're revisiting that line for the fourth time in March of twenty three, 
after that successful back channel test of the downslope, um, and we break above it. And to me, that moment, uh, March of 23, is when I called for a bottom in the, in the bear market. Because to me, you went from a downtrend to a sideways movement and then a clear breakout. Um, you've got this wedge pattern. So it was kind of a declining volume retest of that neckline. Mm -hmm. started to break back out, retested that neckline yet again in September, um, and has now broken clearly above all that noise. So to me, this is extremely constructive pattern. You've got a clear bottoming pattern. You've got two successful retests of it. And now you've got the price action breaking above the consolidation area on expanding volume. So to me, the risk of, of the BTC market is not having a, a big enough position, frankly. I think we've confirmed that the bottom of the bear market's in. Um, and I, and it, to me, it looks like a new uptrend uh, has clearly begun just based on the technicals. I love it. And man, that that bounce off that, off that uh, resistance line there, which is also happens to coincide with the moving average, that is just such a strong bounce too. It's just like, it's just like, no, 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 no. We're testing this, but we're only testing this. We're going bye-bye. Uh, I like that. Um, Cool. Yeah, that's a great chart, and I so and it's a great example of a head and shoulders, a reverse head and shoulders pattern. It would be right because it, because it's happening uh, underneath as opposed to the top. Exactly. Uh, yeah, and they're yeah. really power. They can be really powerful bottoming patterns. They're really consistent, reliable, and and it gives you a measured move, right? So the measured move here would be, you know, the distance from the bottom of the head to the neckline. Right. The projection is from the neckline, the same distance above on a logarithmic scale. That took us to a prediction point of 35K. And it's not surprising to me that here BTC was, you know, 35K right about here is kind of consolidating mm -hmm. along this level. You've got some people that probably took that trade, the profit taking. It's obviously got a lot of resistance if you look back to the 2021 bull market as yeah. well. Cool. And so I actually, I want to do a whole episode on this next topic, but just to throw it out there, since you've got the chart in front of you, what if someone is wants to build a, their first BTC position right now and they've got this chart, you've got this chart right here that kind of shows um, how this reversal is happening. Um, if they wanted to start buying Bitcoin now, let's say they want, they had like, I don't know, 100K and they wanted to break it into a, three chunks maybe um, and start, start buying some Bitcoin. How would you, based on what you've got in front of you, uh, where would you maybe place some orders in and how would you execute on that? Yeah, so tough question because the chart isn't giving me a clear entry point right here, right now. But what I've noticed yeah. is, um, just to try and give you a more of a clear answer there, is we've got the, da the sloping downtrend through the whole bear market, the sideways yeah. move. And now let me just draw kind of the new, I'm just going to draw a kind of midpoint. Mm -hmm. You can see this new kind of upslope that we've got that's begun, Yep. right? Okay. So if you want it to me, if you want to look at a good entry point, I would be looking at that, you know, probably connecting the the lows along that new trend that's starting to develop. So I can kind of let me stretch this out a bit. Yep. Yep. So, you know, draw draw a line something like this and 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 look, I mean, my philosophy is if you're going to buy in three chunks, maybe buy a third of it right here right now because who knows. Um and this yep. thing, you know, may not retest and you certainly wouldn't want the the market to run away without you. Um but buy a third of it now and then you know, keep an eye on it. And if it does come back and let's say it does a back channel retest of 30K, which is definitely possible and that happens in you know, kind of January timeframe, you can buy another chunk um, yep. or, or you could perhaps buy the other two thirds there. I mean, I think we've got what, what appears to be a new kind of upsloping channel here. So that's, that's how I would think about it. There's no, there's no perfect science on that. And, and again, I don't love yep. these horizontal lines, but um, just one way to think about it for entry point. I think Ethereum, once we get there, has a much more clear entry point if you're not in right here. All right, so I'm gonna stick with daily bars. I have to fit this in the screen a little bit better. Um, so this is the Ethereum chart, um, and this captures really the full 2020, 2021 bull market, which is kind of this whole messy phase that you see here on the left-hand side. And then on the right-hand side, I have drawn in the pattern that I think is just a beautiful pattern Cla going back to classical charting that is an ascending triangle extremely reliable pattern um and and mm -hmm. what you see here with eth is if we look at the horizontal red line it's a clear demarcation of support and resistance this was resistance before you know kind of in the early days of 21 right before the bull market really took off so february 21 was resistance we had a big yeah. correction right then we challenged it again here in april 21 broke above it you 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 had a massive move from 2000 up to 4,300, I mean, over a 100% move pretty much instantly 
And then yep. it's a messy kind of retest here through the through the bull market, but it did actually hold, even though it's not a perfect hold. It did hold along that you know twenty one hundred level. Um, made a second high, as we all know, in November. Um, and then here you can see another successful retest, lower high as the bear market's starting to develop, and then a massive breakdown to kick off the bear market in earnest in May of 2022. Since then, <clears throat> we had the ultimate low, um, which June of, of 22 was kind of right after the uh, Luna debacle. Right. And then yep. and then what's fascinating about the Ethereum chart is if you go to the FTX collapse, which was early November. So right about here, first, second week that of November. Volume too. Look at that volume. And also BTC made a new low uh, on the FTX collapse. Ethereum made a higher low. So again, mm. going back to that that technical theory of higher lows and their significance, to me, that was this was the point where you could make the call that on an event like FTX with Ethereum making a higher low and then starting to continue back up, uh, 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 higher in price, that the, that the bottom of the market was in. Um, and then the pattern that's developed since is you can see a very clear ascending triangle where the, it's produced you know, a series of one, two, three higher lows, and it has now retested this breakdown level at 2100, one, two, and now we're back at that same point of support and resistance for the third time. Um, yeah. This is an extremely reliable pattern. You've got an ascending triangle at a key point of support and resistance. Um, and the target, if this one breaks out, is 3,400. So that's about a 50% a plus move. Now, when I mentioned a clear entry point, um, what I'm looking for with ETH is um, potentially one more buying opportunity where you see the price kind of on declining volume trickle yeah, back down 1750 to, maybe yep 1700 1750 which we know was a really key point i mean look at how many times 1700 held here mm -hmm. you know one two three four five it's been a really significant price level so if you're looking to get long eth i think if it touches this upsloping line that's where you could get massively long even with a tight stop and then the last thing i wanted to point out i'm going to bring us back to the last cycle um and just kind of the fractal that's that's developed here. Let me see if actually I can get both okay. in the same view. I might have to switch to a weekly. Let's take a look at this first. You you know what I wanted to point out here is that going into the 2017 bull market, you had an ascending triangle that actually kicked off that bull market. ETH went from 350 bucks all the way up to you know 1400 in basically a single move um, yeah. with some vol. But it looks very similar to today. And let me switch uh -huh. to a switch to a weekly view. And there you can kind of start to see how, like you said earlier in the pod, you know, history doesn't repeat, but it often rhymes, right? It's a little bit of a different setup, but to me, um, you can see a beautiful fractal here and also just the historical reliability of an ascending triangle in the price of Ethereum. So to me, this is, when I look at the space, this is the most bullish and exciting chart that's out there. And again, it targets 3,400 on ETH, which would be a massive move. Yeah, and it's interesting in, in in most of your examples too. So when we go through these like manic bull phases, you know, you can divide that that big uptrend into a couple of chunks. There's always like some sort of like mini blow off tops kind of along the way. And it looks like in both cases, your sort of resistance, which then becomes support, those those main red lines that you have there, they both kind of start at one of those kind of halfway points through the cycle. Um and I, I noticed that that repeat across a couple, a bunch of different charts, actually, that that's usually we, we don't put a lot of credit to it because we usually like blow past it and then the real cycle begins. But later on, it comes back to become like a support, uh, an important um, support line later on. Yeah, 100 percent. It's like you're getting one solid support and resistance line that travels all the way through each bull and bear market. And we've seen it twice consistently yeah. now. Um, and if you've got if we've got time for it, I got one more chart that I wanted to show, and then I want to kick it back to you and see what else what else you've got. I'd love to. Cool. Um, this is a um, I guess we can call it an altcoin, um, but it's it's actually the chart of Coinbase, uh, the uh -huh. actual chart of Coinbase. And I know this is one that you and I have been talking about for a little bit. Let me let me yep. swing down to a daily view. And in fact, a conversation you and I had over drinks um, got me pretty bold up on Coinbase. Uh, fortunately, so so I got long. Coinbase. And our, and our conversation happened to happen at a great freaking time. Yes. Yep. It was right after a right after a sell off. So it's had quite the move since then. Um, and uh, and and yeah. And I just want to point out, you know, it's really the same 
pattern. You had the Coinbase, uh, if I can fit this all on the screen on a daily, because I like this daily view. Um, you had the Coinbase IPO. Um, interestingly enough, at the top of the bull market, this is April, yeah. I believe, of 21. Uh, yep, April of 21. IPO at over $400 a share. And then it subsequently lost over 90% of its value, um, ultimate low in January of 23 at about 30 bucks a share. Um, so it just got completely annihilated Man. from the day it, it listed. 10% right? of less than 10% of it's where it started at. And we can do the same thing that we did when we were looking at the Bitcoin chart. I can just simply draw, look at this downtrend. Mm -hmm. Clear, I'm just drawing the center point of it, just a clear downtrend, right? But then mm -hmm. if we if we zoom out, you know, clearly we can see that going back to May of 22, it's really gone from a downtrend to a sideways move. So the chart's giving you so much information here. It's the same exact trend we were looking at with BTC. And on top of it, it has formed yet again our favorite inverse head and shoulders pattern. Um, and it is making its way back up to the neckline at 115. This is a massive head and shoulders on a logarithmic scale. Ooh, this baby. this to me suggests that Coinbase in the next bull market could go all the way back to its all time highs of four hundred bucks. That's a that's a four hundred percent move relative to the roughly hundred dollars that it's trading at today. So a huge thank you to you for pointing that one out to me and uh, opportunity to get long before this all started. <laughs> yeah, it just happened to be good timing. Uh, I've just been thinking about it as like an index for crypto. Like it's so hard for traditional investors to get um, to get access to the crypto markets, you know, in their e trade account, and I feel like. Obviously, they know that, or some people know they can, uh, they can buy micro strategy or something. But that's that's a sophisticated like uh, lens on how to trade the markets. I think. But buying Coinbase, I feel like that's the app that all the crypto noobs have on their phone. I feel like that's a, kind of the first thought. It's it, it is that it might just be that simple. Um, and that's that's kind of why I liked it. Um, but man, I wanted to stress too on that chart you were just showing. You were talking. This was a multi-year. We were like zooming around across multiple years, and this. Being so zoomed out thing is so important because, you know, you put on a position and then you're paying so much attention to it that you're paying too much attention to it in almost every every case, right? You're watching the day-to-day -day price. Maybe you're like over the course of weeks, you're watching it. But that, that pattern that you were watching emerge, that was a two or three year pattern forming, which means you're looking for a two or three year move to come from that. And it's really important to just be so freaking patient. It's the hardest thing on earth. Like it's not going to do exactly what you want it to do. But if you 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 got to build that conviction to be long. And uh, and and that's what we were seeing there was maybe the the beginnings of a of a long conviction trade. Yeah, um, dude, that's that's so well that. that's so well said. And it's it's just connected a few things that you said um, in our convo today. And and frankly, it's like the reason you want to zoom out and start from that starting point is what is the secular trend. What is the long-term trend? And I want to be, if the long-term trend is up, I want to be have a bias to be long. If the long-term trend is down, I want to be out of the way or a bias to be short if you trade the markets both ways. And um, it's totally fine if you want to trade the intermediate cycles, right? I mean, and there's, there's yeah. cyclical periods that happen within a secular trend. Um, and I think that's totally fine. I mean, I certainly do that. So when, when sentiment stretched and crypto's ripping to new all-time highs, I'm dollar cost averaging out a little bit. And then when it's, you mm -hmm. know, in its sideways consolidation, bear market phase, producing these beautiful head inverse head and shoulders bottoming patterns, I'm dollar cost averaging in. I'm buying those. I'm contributing to the support that's being built underneath the market. Um, but again, always with a bias to want to be long. Because if I zoom out, and you can do this with any altcoin. Like if you're interested in buying an altcoin and it's been around for a few years, go exactly back to your advice. Start with a monthly chart, start with a weekly chart. Go all the way back to the beginning and ask yourself, if I drew a line through the center of this chart, is the trend up and to the right or down and to the right? You know, and depending on your answer, um, that's how that's how your bias should should uh, affect your positioning. Yeah, it's basic trend following. You And Michael Covell is a big trend following guy. He's got a, a pod where he talks about that a lot and brings on a lot of um, investors. And a lot of these funds and indexes and stuff, they just are strictly long term trend following strategies. That's all they're doing. So. There's so much like it's not momentum, I'd say, but it's so hard. To, it's so hard to move the trend. It takes years to reverse a trend in many cases. So um, and since that's where most of the money is, that's kind of why it, it's it's a bit slow. Um, and since crypto is so early in its evolution as a, as a market at all, maybe those trends reverse a bit quicker. And um, we've also got this cycle thing going on. Um, and I always I have a I have an episode you can go back on. It's something about like invest for the long term, but trade the cycle. 
That's that's the way I've always thought about it. Like, you know, at some point you got you got to take some profits or you got to enter. And like, how are you gonna? If you can be long and put on a few trades a year or a few trades every few years and and trade that cycle along with being long term, as in like decade long uh, positions. Uh, which as of uh, two weeks ago, I had my decade long position hit. So that that was fun. Yeah, um, actually, I, I listened yeah. to I listened to your was that your brother who was on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I listened to that on my drive back to Boulder today. Um, nice. <laughs> and um, I love that conversation. I think I had you beat by like four or five days. Uh, I know. November first was my was my first. Yes, one. there's a whole story a lot around that, but I'll skip it for uh, for for today. But um, yeah, that was oh, a fun. Well, congrats on your 10 year anniversary as well. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. That's a fun combo for anyone who hasn't gone back and and listened to that one or two episodes ago as well. I would I recommend for people who, like myself who weren't as familiar with the BitLift history and the relaunch, um, go back to fifty seven and, and take a listen. I found that to be super interesting. I really enjoyed it. Cool. I'm glad you did. We're just kicking things back into gear here, and so that, that those were fun fun ways to warm warm things up a little bit, you know. Uh, so yeah, I, I I just pulled another chart up here. I pulled up the ETH chart again. I just wanted to show you this. I, I'm the only person I've I've never seen anyone talk about like putting the market caps on the price charts. And I just find it interesting. Like we like this this last cycle for ETH was is ETH a five hundred billion dollar asset or not? We we made the decision. It's not. It just isn't. It wanted to be and it's not. This is the five hundred. The first, you know, the first attempt we had this weird kind of double top last cycle. The first attempt, we just like gave a five hundred billion a go. It didn't like it. Uh and then we retested it. It decided it wasn't comfortable being a five hundred billion dollar asset, and the cycle's over. That was it. So here we are, uh, the trillion dollar cycle. We can call it. How do I? Yeah, the trillion dollar cycle. A trillion dollar market cap would be eight thousand three hundred. Hmm. So, is does ETH want to be a trillion dollar asset next cycle? It feels like a a number that uh, I could get behind. And I mean, from here, where are we? Sixteen hundred to eighty three hundred. It's a beautiful move, and it seems very possible to me. It's a it's a great way to think about. It. I also, you know, people get caught up in looking at the price of a particular token um, mm -hmm. and thinking that it's cheap or expensive, right? Like um, Bitcoin's expensive at thirty six thousand, and maybe Solana's cheap at fifty bucks. But you actually, you really need to look at it on a market cap basis. It's the price of the token multiplied by the number of tokens that either are in circulation or can ultimately yep. be created. Um, so I, I love the way you're looking at that. It's a much cleaner view. Yeah, I actually, and I, I, I adjust these market caps every few months or so based on like what supply has come out since. Just to keep it like, I know it's not going to be like hyper accurate, but it's pretty accurate. It's in the right range. Um, and so I, I try to move them based on supply. Bitcoin supply is a lot uh, easier to guess. Uh, and I always go to what's uh, ultrasound money is a great spot to see what the what's going on right now with the the Ethereum supply. Um, and so as of right now, it looks like we're burning ETH about thousand ETH a year at the current rate that we're at. Um, and so, yeah, that's not going to who knows what's going to happen with ETH supply. We could, we should do an episode on that at some point for sure. Bitcoin supply is up and to the right and slowly tapping out until we get to 21, 21 million and it's going to happen. All right, cool. So that's uh, my ETH chart. Let's see what else I got for you. So, you know, I always start with fundamentals. Like I, I, I invest in a project because I like the project. I like the, their narrative. I like what they're working on. And then my first step is I always use the damn thing, try and get a sense for like how it's being used. Can I even use it? Is anyone going to be able to figure this out? Those types of things. And then I hop into the charts, typically because I'm like ready to build a position and I'm trying to gauge where to buy in at, where to set my stops at, where... Uh, a few of these different things that only the chart can tell you. Um, so let's see. I've been one of the narratives I've been following is the real world assets narrative. This idea of stocks and bonds and stable coins and all these things coming on to blockchains. Um, and I'm some of the projects. Uh, Avalanche, I think, is one of the projects that I think is adopt. Whether they were invented for this reason or not, or they're just adopting the narrative or not, uh, I don't really care because they're adopting it now. Um, it's just had this awesome run here, and I feel like everything's kind of had this run, but the volume that it experienced on this run was really strong. Um, it's testing now like this trend line that I think uh, it's kind of it's at the top end of its current trend line. So I've got some orders in a bit lower, um, but it's in this it's in this wedge here that I feel like could become uh, uh, another kind of um, consolidation zone 
going into the next cycle. And I really like it's at 20 bucks. And it, I, I'm only looking at things that I think can 10x this cycle. If it can't 10x, I got other I got other stuff to to, to dig through. You know, um, I think this is a, a, a one of the potential 10x uh, options. It's just a very basic chart, uh, but this is the one that I've been keeping an eye on. Yeah, and I, lo- I love I love the um, expression of the RWA view with with uh, Avalanche because. Um, yeah, for those who don't know it, they they actually have um, unique for L ones programmable side chains, um, and yeah. that's why they're being it's being adopted for uh, tokenization projects for RWAs because if you've got regulatory parameters or distribution parameters, um, you can actually program that into a secure side chain that adopts the security of the Avalanche protocol. Um, and and actually, there was an article um, I don't remember the name of the f- fund. There's an article in CoinDesk yesterday. If people want to go back. Um, uh, or we can drop it in the show notes um, that there was a VC fund that actually launched their fund on Avalanche for that exact reason. It's a pretty yeah. sizable fund. So yeah, I think you're going to see more and more of that trend and the chart doesn't look too bad as well. Yeah, I do too. Uh, they call them subchains on Avalanche. The one tricky thing about it is if you launch a subchain, apparently you, one of the parameters you can set is that you don't need to use AVIX as the, as the fee token. You can you can use whatever token on of the, the native token of your subchain you can use that for the fees so i don't see how that then accumulates value to the avax token um it's just an interesting thing to keep an eye on <laughs> the token doesn't always need a revenue model in order to work in crypto which we've learned uh, over time but i would like to see demand for a for avax come from all of these chains popping up yeah, uh, that's something I'm looking for. This bull market actually is: will the market be more discerning? I think that's the right question to ask. Because like, mm-hmm. do you, do you use the token? What do you use it for? What is the use? What's TBL? You know, um, TBD. If the market will care, or if we're still just trading narratives, I kind of I kind of yeah. think we're still just trading narratives. But um, maybe the market will be a bit more discerning than it was last cycle. I agree, TBD. That's for sure. Oh, I see you got uh, gold on there. <laughs> it's the only. Uh, I have Coinbase and gold are the only non crypto. Uh, <laughs> Things I keep on here, just think, you know, because I like to see a little green uh, on the on here on a down day, and so <laughs> that's why I keep gold there. <laughs> uh, this next one here is the chain link. I've been I've been buying some chain link. Uh, I accumulated quite a bit here between five and six bucks, which just happened to be an epic time before this wild run. Uh, it just tripled overnight. It felt like, um, but it also tripled almost exactly to where I had one of these resistance lines that was just already there and i love when that happens um it just is a good sign to me that like <laughs> that my doodles are are working in some weird way um but yeah so that's where this is what chain look looks like now i think uh i don't see it's going back to uh the support line anytime soon here but i'm keeping an eye on um this is clearly being treated as resistance um and then maybe we can use this this other um resistance line like this downtrend resistance line maybe this might be a zone here I'm in the ten dollar range to hopefully pick up some more if I wanted to add on. It also correlates with this um, this kind of waypoint we had in the last cycle uh, over here. So I've been thinking about. I actually have some orders in. I think at like ten dollars and ten cents, eleven dollars eleven cents, and twelve dollars and twelve cents. That's how I staggered my my buys. They're sitting there waiting. Uh, I, I I assume at one point I'll wake up one morning and some or all of that will trigger and I'll have more link, but. Uh, that's what I've been keeping an eye on. Yeah, that's a good that's a good looking chart. Um, you know, I, I you you this is another one where fundamentally I think you've got a good thesis around CCIP and what they're trying to build. Um, you know, it's an interesting project for this cycle, and and you know it, it triggered something else I I wanted to share. You can't see it here with mm. um, Link, but if you go back to uh, other like Dogecoin, for example, which you brought up earlier, um, yeah. for for coins that traded through multiple cycles now, one of the things mm-hmm. I always look for is, did it make a, a new high in the last bull market, right? Because yeah. then it's it's either it's either it's either working towards network effect or it's being distributed for profit. Um, and you know, here with Doge, you can clearly see it's 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 made a much higher high each cycle. Um, mm-hmm. And it's to me that's that's becoming a network effect type of asset. So love it or hate it, I think, you know, the chart kind of speaks for itself that this thing's being adopted. Chainlink, we don't have that kind of history, um, but it will no. be interesting to see if it can, you know, ultimately eclipse the high from the last bull market. I have this this Bitcoin chart where I kind of, I crunch um, 
how much so Bitcoin obviously had fresh all times highs each cycle, right? Um, the 2013 it was like 1100. Um, then tw- then we had 20k, and then we had 69k, and the la- those are the last three cycles. And I crunch the numbers on how how much are we is the growth decelerating over time, right? Because this 2013 cycle we went from two dollars to, to to 1100. I mean that's the most explosive growth you can possibly get, like exponential growth. Um, and then from 11 to 20, it's still an epic run, but it's not two to a thousand. It's just different. It's decelerating. And so I have a chart somewhere. I'll have to pull it up. Maybe I'll put it in the show notes where I crunch how much we're decelerating over the course of the of the previous cycles. Um, and based on the current deceleration, um, it, it points at a 96K top for for this next cycle for Bitcoin. Um, any, anything can happen, obviously. All this institutional money and ETFs might just make that irrelevant at this point. Or maybe... Maybe we are still decelerating and 100K, I mean, hey, 100K is a lot better than, is, is much higher high than 70K, but it's not kind of that exponential growth that we've, we've experienced over the last 10 years. Really interesting. Yeah, that would still be, you know, a 5X off the bear market lows. Um, yep. But yeah, and it would catch, you know, I think for everyone looking for 100K next cycle, it would catch a lot of people in a poor position if it topped just below that. So yeah, it's a, that's an interesting number we shall see the last one i'll pull up here um it's just something i've been keeping an eye on because there's just a lot of drama around it and a lot of a lot of news this was it and it just smacked my resistance line so perfectly i just love when that happens so much um this is rune this is like a a decentralized exchange that allows you to swap natively between chains so you can literally swap native eth for native bitcoin within your wallet the whole chain is designed around it um i have some episodes back um, with my buddy Sam, who we we dug in, he's like he's like a, a community ambassador for for Thorchain, and Rune is the token of Thorchain. Um, we dove deep into into the Rune. Um, it's kind of growing, maybe for some reasons that uh, like reasons that some people might not like, but it's being used for a lot of activities that uh, people couldn't find other places uh, to execute on. Let's say. Uh, and but it it really is a truly decentralized exchange. Like who cares what people are using it for? There's demand, and there's going to be I think more demand for these types of things moving forward as regulation kind of crunches our space really hard and makes things difficult. Um, and just this this run it just went on from eighty cents to five dollars is pretty epic. I I like to see at, like where we are at our stage in the cycle. We're coming into the next big chapter of this cycle. I've I want to see everything participate. Everything that I'm, I have a list of of tokens that I'm like debating whether to maybe um, put into my token basket. And if they're not participating at all, like right now, I I don't know if they're going to ever participate, which means that's, that's maybe not something I want to stick in my basket. So I like, this was one of the ones in my maybe basket. The fact that it's finding uh, a lot of strong volume right now and some new use cases, um, that's exciting for me. Um, whereas it's at five bucks and it's all time high is 20. That's a three X, but, uh, you know, it doesn't mean that 20 is the all time high. So if it's going to set some new highs here and find some new demand, uh, it's just something I've been keeping an eye on. Yeah. I really like the, the rune thesis. Um, first of all, to your point, a lot of people are using it right now. Yeah. Um, and with the way these dynamic liquidity pools work, like you actually have to convert to rune and use it in the pools um you do so it has an underpinning of of demand if you want to use thorchain you need rune um even if you just want to contribute a single asset to a pool um you, it's going to create demand for rune um just through your contribution i like yeah. that a lot and then also you know one of the core uh one of the core clear tenets of this asset class is permissionlessness disintermediation, you know, and, and we see, like, I think just this week, the SEC is now coming after Kraken. They just mm-hmm. took CZ out of Binance and fined them $4.3 billion. We know they're in Today. litigation with Coinbase. You know, it's like the government is trying to kill this thing. Um, and the decentralized exchanges uh, or mechanisms for that, like Thorchain, uh, are are incredibly valuable. Um, and And I think have this underpinning of reflecting the value that is in permissionless technology, um, it really can't be stopped. And so I think, yeah, regardless of how people are using it, um, it has a fundamental use case. People need it. Um, and look at that chart. That's a, that, that chart to me is, uh, yeah, a nice buying opportunity here, but 
overall, I'd like to see it get up above those kind of 2022, late 22 highs, um, yeah. I guess early 2022 highs, but nonetheless, it looks like it's well on its way. Yeah. If I was putting orders in here, I'd probably put them here around like the $4 range, somewhere somewhere above this uh, support level. Um, I think it had a quite an epic run here. It, it's going to have to cool off a little bit. I mean, it didn't cool off in 2021, right? It just kept freaking going. Uh, but 2021 was was mania. So let's see what it can do here in the off in the in the thawing in the spring in the spring. Let's see what it can do in the spring. Uh, and then when summer comes around, maybe it's game on. So that's just something another one I'm keeping an eye on. Uh, and that's the charts I've got for now. That just some pretty basic stuff. For the most part, I'm 90 percent of the time I'm looking at Bitcoin and ETH, to be honest. And then when I'm eyeing uh, an alt to, to build a position, that's where I'm going to draw some lines and and come up with some ideas. Um, but yeah, cool. Brian, man, this was really epic. I appreciate you coming on. Like you said, I know you've been studying this stuff for a long, long time. So I've I've never dug anywhere near as deep as you have. And it was so cool when we met to discover that like, I'm on the right track. I was like, oh, wow. Like he's been doing this forever. Like professionally, I'm just dicking around in my basement. And it seems like I came to a lot of the same conclusions as you. So that was uh, really helpful for me to 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 learn and uh, it seems like uh, we're on the same page and up and to the right, man. Yeah, uh, likewise. Um, and I would just say, like, wh- I, I might be good at, at at kind of fundamental view. I've been in the space a long time. Um, have studied TA and other you know aspects of the market, but I'm not really a great idea guy. Um, whereas you are, and and in our conversations over the last couple of months, you've thrown out a ton of ideas. Um, and, you know, if I just look at the charts, a lot of the ideas you've had are um, being confirmed by the charts. So I've it's paid for cool. me to listen to you. I suggest other people um, take a listen when you're bullish on something and why. Um, and and like I always say, you know, I never tell anyone jump in and buy anything in this space. Like nothing we've said here is investment advice, clearly. Um, but go study it. Go do the work. Um, and I've already benefited from uh, hopping on the train for a couple of your, your really creative ideas the last few months. So thanks for that. Epic, man. Well, this has been fun. Uh, we'll have you back on again. Maybe we'll have some new charts to display or we'll kind of talk uh, where we are in the cycle at certain points. That's always fun to try to gauge. Um, maybe we'll throw out some predictions at some point. I think it might be maybe too soon for some of those. Uh, but we're getting there, man. And it's going to be a wild ride. Beautiful. Thanks for having me on the pod, man. I appreciate it.